least the right about our pay-per-views before I get the numbers from Campbell on Monday. <laughs> know what we did before we know what we did. I've been asking him that for years. Where do you get He's your numbers, secret, Dave? He's yes. He's got secret sources he doesn't even tell you about. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, he, he's got people in the cable industry that give him the unofficial numbers long before they ever get to the rest of us, so it's it's a very interesting situation. But well, i got to tell you, his, his knowledge, though, of professional wrestling, and then his willingness to get into MMA and see this thing for what it was, he was the first guy who got it. Everybody else later said, well, isn't this like tough man? Or, 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 yeah. Dave Meltzer came in and said, let me tell you something. These guys are doing impressive numbers. He said, I don't, and he, he, in fact, he coined, he coined the expression, it's, they're like the two guys in Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid who keep saying, who are these guys? Where did they come from? He quoted that line from that movie. He said, all the guys in wrestling keep looking over their shoulder and saying, is Art Bailey and Campbell McLaren. It's fascinating. Good stuff. Well, that was actually the first question I was going to ask you was once you saw UFC take off, when you got it off the ground and everybody started realizing what it was, did, it, did you know that wrestling was going to come after the fighters and start trying to bring them into pro wrestling? Did you have any inkling that guys like Ken Shamrock were going into WWE? Not only did I know that was going to happen, but they knew that I was going after their guys. As your associate, Dave Meltzer, knows, I was interested early on in Meng. Oh, really? The Samoan. I had heard from the professional wrestlers that, hey, outside of the professional wrestling ring, nobody wanted to mess with him because he'd keep kick your butt. Yeah, he had the tough guy reputation in all the really locker rooms. Yeah. Tough guy reputation. So early on, I was thinking about Meng, see? So the wrestling people knew that I was starting to make some calls. And later on, I brought in the Viking, Tony Hanelman, who eventually ended up in Norway in his own country as a senator, mm-hmm. and got knocked out very quickly by Randy, the natural couture. <laughs> so early on, the wrestling people knew. I'm not sure Steve Bischoff had my picture up on his wall, but he knew who I was, because I wanted good wrestlers who could really fight, and he wanted guys like Tank Abbott and Ken Shamrock, who had charisma enough to be in the professional wrestling mm-hmm. Made sense. And then one other thing uh, relating to the first UFC, not in terms of knowing where the guys were going, but knowing the guys coming in. Uh, one thing, I've, I've watched the show many times, and I've never figured it out, the one boxing glove, was that something that was planned all along, or was that something that, that Jimerson said, I, I have to... I, I've still not been able to figure that out to this day. In my book, Is This Legal?, in that chapter, I talk about Jimerson... During the dress rehearsal, as all the fighters were compelled to do, show me what he's going to wear that night. So he shows me his great boxing trunks with Art King Jimerson on there, Mm -hmm. and silver and white, the black trunks. I said, no problem. I had never asked him all along during that week. I figured he's bringing gloves, he's bringing boxing shoes. He's a boxer. Mm -hmm. He's ranked 10th in the world by the IBC. There's talk in the sports press about the fact that he's due to fight six weeks after the UFC, Tommy Hitman Hearns, who was in the Boxing Hall of Fame. So I figured I didn't have to check on his equipment. He's a pro. Now, the night of the show, I'm now checking everybody for the equipment that they're going to fight with. And Jimison turns to me when I get to his dressing room. He says, where do I get gloves and boxing shoes? I said, what? <laughs> Say what? I said, are you serious? He said, I, I didn't bring no stuff. I said, well, what, what were you planning on doing? He said, I was planning on asking you. So I turned around, I had a, my walkie talkie, I'm screaming in it to my staff. I said, I got a major crisis. So Kathy Kidd runs down and says, what do we need? I said, get my kid brother who's over the hotel. He was like, well, your staff's all committed. I said, bring him over here right away. And she gets my brother over in about 10, 15 minutes. I opened up my wallet, I took out three $100 bills. I said, Kathy's gonna show you where there's a sporting goods store with boxing gloves and shoes. You take a cab over there, you get that stuff, and you get back here yesterday. <laughs> so my kid brother, who's just getting ready to enjoy the fights that night, he's got like a sport coat on and combed his hair. Mm, it's he's like, getting yeah. ready to enjoy. Mm-hmm. And now I got him in a cab. He's going to Arveda, a distant suburb in Denver. Mm-hmm. And now, now I'm yelling at this point, you know, at, at Jimerson, who's looking at me like, you know. But my brother finally shows up, and he shows up at the front gate, and when he doesn't have his pass on, he didn't think to bring the pass. So now that the, the security guards are telling our staff, there's some nut with boxing gloves who well, I guess is here to fight. Only he, maybe he's just a fan who wants to fight. He's got gloves. <laughs> he's kind of small. 
So, but they finally let my brother in, and I'm yelling, Matthew, come here with the glove. No, no, don't stop. Don't tell me how much it costs. Come over here. So I run into the art, you know, art genesis dressing room. I say, Art, I got everything here for you. He said, but these are running shoes. I said, beggars can't be choosers. We couldn't get your boxing shoes, but we got your brand new pair of Nikes in the size that I know your feet are. Put them on and get ready. Okay. Now I go back to the truck. I'm checking on the pay-per-view broadcast with our director, Mark Lucas, our producer, Mark Michael Pilot. And I'm looking at the camera, and I'm checking on, the, you know, everything that's going on. And by the time we had done the first, you know, fight, which is now history about, we got Gerard Gordeau, the, the fighter from Holland, Sabat, kickboxing, fighting the sumo wrestler. That incredible fight's in the can. And of course, now I've got Art Jimerson. And, 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 uh, you know, in the third fight, I get Jimerson and, uh, and Gracie. And uh, I'm in the truck again at that point. And I'm scratching my head because I'm looking and I can't believe what I'm seeing. Finally, the director, Mark Lucas, says to me, Art, do you know what's going on? And all I would word, I, there were words coming out. I could say, I, 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 I. he said, "What do you know? What's going on?" I said, "I can't believe it." I think he showed. Where's the other glove? He had decided on his own that he was just going to wear the one glove because he was going to try to grab boys with his and then hit him with a left hook. And by that time, I can't even run out to the side of the octagon. I'm in the truck. I'm a hundred yards away. It's too late. The announcer's getting ready to announce them. The referee's getting ready to stage them. And so there's the answer to why Art Jimerson. By the way, he has since gone on, and I don't know how many appearances he's made as Art One Glove Jimerson. And he and Hoyce have auctioned off a glove. And I don't think it's the original glove because that's long gone. But they have auctioned off some version of it about eight times at different places around the country and even the world. So that decision just turned out to be a godsend. It actually was better than if he had come out with two gloves because nobody would remember it at this point. Nobody would be talking about it. It wouldn't be history. Exactly. So when you when you decided to leave after you'd done five shows and 18 fights, what was your mindset at that point? Did, did you think you'd taken it as far as it could go? Well, I decided uh, after UFC 5 to sell because we were hiring civil and criminal attorneys to do this event. And I'm thinking, and this is in the New South in Charlotte, I figured, what's it going to take to get this show to Chicago or L.A. or New York? So at that point, uh, I decided that the better part of valor was to sell out. And, of course, I had a partner who was rubbing their hands together going, we'd like to buy. In fact, Bob Myers had expressed to private me on more than one occasion that he wanted to buy Horian. Now, he and Horian didn't get along that well. He once made the mistake in our first meeting of telling Horian that he knew about fighting uh -huh. and that he could have been the world's first Jewish heavyweight champion if he had only stuck with it. <laughs> of course, I guess he forgot about Max Baer. But uh, Horian and he didn't get along well. So when we decided, Horian, finally and on, it was my decision primarily to sell out the UFC 5, I stayed on board for the next two and a half years as matchmaker and booker. But I knew that we had to sell out because I suspected that the politicians and the media were, were, were starting to gang up on us. Mm -hmm. It was getting tough. So it was no longer beneficial because you talked about how John McCain calling it human cockfighting was actually beneficial for a while. Well, I, I've, I've told the story over and over again that the advertising was a collaborative joint of, of, of decision by WOW Promotions, our company, Orion and, Orion and Mar, and Center for Entertainment. But it was a two-edged sword. We knew that, the, that the, the, the potential disaster of advertising, of saying the Christians are meeting the lions, mm -hmm. was that all of a sudden, you know, all the blue noses and the prudes would come out and say, you guys are doing a blood sport. This is a no-no. On the other hand, sold a lot of tickets. Two-edged sword. Yeah, absolutely. So... You, you sold and stayed on for a while, and then it got sold again to Zufa. Correct. So, they, what did you think when you saw this transition going through different owners? Did you think it was going to blossom, or did you think that maybe, you know, this could be the writing on the wall, that it was keep being sold over and over again, and it wasn't going to last? You know, it was only said it said sold twice, and the second sale, uh, I knew who the Fertitas were. Um, you know, I had been in this market myself, living in Boulder City. And knew that Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta, sons of Frank Fertitta Sr., had a tremendous reputation in the gaming business. Uh, they had more square footage, I think, than any other single property on the strip when you look at the aggregate amount of properties they had. They understood gambling and gaming very well. So I thought that they had a good chance. And Lorenzo had been one of the commissioners on the Nevada State Athletic Commission. So he had an insight into the process of getting 
may be a sport like mixed martial arts sanctioned. Mm -hmm. I thought in a way that it was interesting and maybe pathetic that the, uh, the Fertitas were now involved. And hey, it took them several years of red ink that they bled before they started to show profit. And they knew, as I did, that you needed a weekly cable show, the same way that Vince McMahon had one in wrestling. Because that's how you build up your heroes and your villains and sell them on pay-per-view. And I won't lie, it was Ultimate Fighter that actually got me to go back and watch those early UFCs because exactly. I wanted to know where it came from. I, I saw that great fight and I said to myself, this just didn't start yesterday. They, Doris Griffin and Yeah, Martin. yeah, they didn't come out of nowhere. This this had to build up for a while. And I'd seen guys in wrestling like Ken Shamrock, but at the same time, that you know, with the human cockfighting thing that was attached to it, a lot of pay-per-view providers weren't carrying it, right. and a lot of parents didn't want their kids to see it. Exactly. And I was that young at the time where it was like, it's a banned sport, it's not on pay-per-view, there's no way we're letting you get these tapes, you're not going to see it. So it wasn't until Ultimate Fighter that I actually had that chance to go back right. and rediscover UFC. So I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And I'm also thankful that you wrote this book because you're such an integral part of the history of this sport. And I think a lot of the times people get focused on what's going on. Like we got UFC 175 this weekend. Right. Everybody's talking about Mishida and Weidman and Rousey and Davis. But we need to also talk about where this sport came from because 20 years later we couldn't be here if you weren't there at that first show on November 12th, 1993. It's true. Mm -hmm. So anything else you want to say about the book in closing before we uh, wrap this up? This is a good book for hardcore fans because if you really want to understand where the UFC and MMA is today, I think being able to go back and read what I've told the tale about the inside story of the first UFC will give you some great insight into the roots of MMA, how it all rolled out. The template and the tracks that I laid down, they're still in place most of them. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it's been a great opportunity for me to tell people my side of the story. Because, hey, I had this idea 25 years ago, and it's been four years to make it a reality. Also, I'm very excited about the fact that I think MMA is going to continue to grow and be huge. I mean, much bigger 20 years from today than it is today. Fans, they went on sale this week, July 1st, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Ascendbooks.com. So it's out there, you can get it as an ebook. you can buy it in hardback. Is this legal? The inside story of the first UFC from Art Davey, the guy who created it.